Hi, welcome to the Digital Insurance Pint Podcast. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jeff Roy and Steve Earle. Adam Mitchell is currently in the hospital getting a colonoscopy. Uh, so in his place, we've got Pete Tessier of the Insurance Podcast, podcaster, a Hall of Famer in Canada, just talking about how he's recorded close to 100 episodes. So um, all's fair, we, uh, he had me on his show a little while ago, so we're having him on our show. Yeah, and uh, Pete, I'll get you to do. I think a lot of people know you, but just in case, I'll get you to do a, do a quick intro of yourself. Um, you know, the only person out here who hasn't been on my podcast is Steve. So you're next up. <laughs> you don't. You're, you're <laughs> no, coming you don't in. want me on your podcast. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> you need some. You um, need some angry Steve. Yeah, some angry Steve. There we go. You know, what? Yeah. I, I, I'm just. A, I'm a guy who's been in the insurance industry for 20 years, and I owned a brokerage. I sold it, and I had to figure out what I was going to do well, these non-compete things kind of stick around and do stuff, but actually it was a friendly non-compete. And I just thought a friend of mine who is a bleeding edge podcaster, um, former radio guy, um, he's leading the edge on podcasting and all sorts of things. He said, you should do an insurance podcast. I said, why the hell would anyone want to do insur- about insurance? <laughs> and he goes, he goes, not for consumers. He goes for people in your industry. And I was like, oh, and he has a podcast called the Sound Off Podcast, and it's the podcast about broadcast. So it's for broadcast professionals. And I thought, hey, well, let's do the insurance podcast. And that's how it started. And it's just sort of introduced me to all sorts of things. And I didn't realize I like talking so much. My wife <laughs> did, but I didn't. <laughs> awesome. Thanks very much, Pete. So, um, that's the uh, that's that's your intro. We're gonna get uh, gonna dive into that a little bit. We got a few questions here that we're gonna uh, use to get to know you a little better. So, sure. quick speed round. What's your favorite Canadian band of all time? My favorite Canadian band of all time. Holy smokes! Probably the Guess Who. Um, a little old school that way. No offense to all the tragically hip lovers out there, but I'm a bit more of a Guess Who fan. But yeah, that's probably it. I have to guess who. Nice. Awesome choice. Awesome choice. All right. What's Very your favorite beer? What's your favorite beer, Pete? My favorite beer? Um, I, 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 how, many, how many do I not have that are favorites? I don't know. Um, honestly, my, my favorite beer right now is probably the Fat Tug IPA. Fat Tug. Fat Tug. Awesome. That's quite, that's quite a name. Yeah. yeah. All right. And we, we sent you a few beers from yes. the East Coast here. Which one did you open up? I, I actually didn't because I forgot to put them in the beer fridge. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're, well. the second, you're the second person. Yeah. So there you go. I'm having right now, I'm having a tr- local one, Trans Canada Brewing out of Winnipeg, blueberry, uh, blueberry ale. Awesome. Nice. All right. We'll I've talk. got the, uh, got the, this is direct from the East Coast. Thank you very much, Steve. Got the Garrisons. Mm-hmm. Got the Blazes Blonde going. How about you guys, Jeff, Steve? I got the Garrison Little Juicy IPA. Oh, yeah. Nice. I'm on the uh, Garrison. What is it? Sasquatch Hop oh, Smash. Nice. You know, wow. We do get the Garrison to... Juicy out here, which is nice. So I've had that before. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's very good. Once, once we start broad, broad, uh, broadening out from insurance, we'll have to get the uh, owner of Garrison's on the podcast. We've been talking about him more often to talk about insurance. Yeah. Uh, Pete, what was your high school nickname? Tess. Tess. Tess, Tess, Tess and Chambers. Chambers. Long story. Chambers. Chambers. It's a long story. Couldn't explain. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll leave hey, what's, uh, by the way, Tom, what's your nickname? We don't think we, uh, we never asked you. In high school. Um, can you say well, it? Is it legal? Let's put it this way. When, uh, when I'm a guest on the podcast, then you can ask me that question. Okay. Right now, good, right now I'm asking real questions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right now I'm going by Gabrielle Reed for some reason. Uh, Pete. Yeah, Gabby, exactly. That's what she usually goes by. Pete, what's your favorite or least favorite part of the industry? My least favorite part of the industry? Either one. Is... Either your most favorite or your least favorite. My, me- my most favorite is the one everyone answers. It's the people. Like, it, it, like, I didn't realize how cool insurance people were before I got into insurance. And like, this is like the best group of people I've ever worked with in all the industries, like hands down. It's not even close. Um, I think the, the worst part about 
the insurance industry is that there are a lot of people who don't want to have difficult conversations. I think there's, and, and people take offense to di difficult conversations because we're too aligned with um, ideologies and points of view. Like the conversation should be simple and easy, even though they're difficult subjects because we're all great people. <laughs> so I don't yeah. think they should be as hard as they are. Yeah. Plus everybody's nice and we're Canadian, eh? We don't want to yeah. offend anybody. So we yeah. got that little uh, Canadianism in there. No, I agree. That's one of the reasons we're on the podcast is to have the brute honest conversations. The ones yeah. that ha the ones that happen in the halls or the ones that happen at three o'clock in the morning when people have been drinking at a convention all day yeah. and they're going to change the world and they wake up and they don't say anything. Exactly. <laughs> True. Speaking of, yeah. speaking of honest conversations, I have a difficult question here for you. Is it wrong for a vegan to eat animal crackers? Well, only if there's lard in the crackers. <laughs> My daughter, who's a vegan, would, uh, would uh, salute that answer. Yeah. Uh, who do you most admire in the Canadian PNC industry? Who do I most admire? Holy smokes. And it's all um, right if you want to say Jeff or Steve. Um, no, we're not. They're definitely not us. You know who? Um, I don't know. I've never, I, I honestly don't know. I think I'd be, um, I'd be offending someone if I said the wrong answer. I've never thought of that. You know who I actually, you just admire. complained about not having hard conversations. Now no, you're no, 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 I got, no <laughs> way. Okay. This is the, there, there's two people. I'll say my father-in-law who brought me into the industry and used to run a very large um, broker out here. That's now owned by Arthur J Gallagher. And I'll say um, my podcast co-host, father as well um reg wyatt who was a pioneer in manitoba feistier than anything you've ever seen and would take no crap from anyone and blaze such an amazing trail for brokers here to stand on their own hind legs and take charge and push forward without guys like that we wouldn't be sitting where we are right now awesome we'd have been swallowed That's up awesome. before. two people i totally admire Awesome. Thanks for the red, red, white. I've never met him, but I love him already. Yeah. Oh, just a pistol. And finally, uh, last question here in the speed round. What sound does a seal make? Oop, oop, oop. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks. I, awesome. Thanks, Pete. So, All right. <laughs> that was probably the hardest question I'm going to ask you. Yeah, there you go. All right, so you just got through. You've you've been uh, you've you've moderated the CEO panel at the Ontario Brokers Association yeah. convention a few times, and the most recent IBO convention, uh, the virtual one, uh, Colin stepped in as the CEO panel moderator. So yeah. we'd like you to describe how Colin was worse than you as the moderator. Oh, well, one, he's hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to nice. get the job back. So no, um, you know what? I, I, in an honest sense, Colin's a, like, he's in a, an enviable position to do those things. And why you have people come from outside is that particularly people with insurance knowledge is I'm not invested in what goes on in IBA. I mean, I'm invested in the broker channel because I believe in it and everything, but I'm not invested in your relationships. I'm an independent. So if there are questions to be asked, I think I can tow right up to the point of stepping over it without offending anyone. So they want to come back and then they can say, well, it'd be great. You know, that was great. Um, who's this idiot from Manitoba you brought in, but he was actually not that bad. So, I mean, that's, I think that's what I can do that maybe others who like Colin who have to go and then turn around and go talk to Rowan or talk to Louie or talk to Carol in a meaningful way about interactions with associations that, um, you know, that I can do that he can't. That's sort of my, always been my value proposition is let me, do, let me take the bullet for you. Uh, and when you're independent, you can do that. Yes. And you know, exactly. without having to worry about, you know, what, uh, you know, having to worry about the meeting you're, you're about to have that with that guy, you know, the next day yeah. that may be a little more difficult because of that conversation. Yeah. How many, how many CEO panels have you done? Pete? I've done four now. Wow. Yeah. Who's, uh, I thought Colin did a great job. No, he uh, did. He, he did a question. really good job. And, uh, and but a shout out to him. He made the top 100 list of top yeah. insurance executives what? in, the, in uh, the world. So that's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. So, okay. I, I really so, like Colin. Um, so, he's a great guy. 
we, here's, we here's need more bullet. Collins in the industry. Here's a bullet for you. Uh, so you've done, you said four. Yeah. Um, who was the best CEO? Who's the best who CEO? Who sucked and who sucked? You know yeah, who? Like insofar the, as the panel, not not their job necessarily. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you. But on a panel, honesty, that yeah. sort of thing. Okay, who the best CEO? Um, honestly, for for personality, is Louis Gagnon because Louis is just hilarious and he has a sense of humor and you can rib him hard and he knows exactly what's going on and he masks it very well in 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 his personality but he he's he's an architect of what's going on at intact and, or and part of the architecture team and they're con they do a lot of controversial things um but he's also the worst in some ways because he doesn't own up to that <laughs> um, um there goes my in intact what, contract what, what, what do you mean he doesn't own i don't think it? he truly owns up to the things that um intact is doing that are creating friction points in the relationship with brokers in their client centers and stuff like that. He talks about it, but he doesn't own the purpose of why they're doing it. The overall strategy is how it fits to intact and how brokers are either part of it or not. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, it's like a kiss. It's like giving someone a kiss on the cheek and then giving the person behind them the middle finger on the back. And now I've really shot myself in the foot. I just, I just took the bullet and blew it in my own chest here. But that's, that's sort of the challenge here. I mean, on, on another side, the actual all-time worst panel guest I ever had, and you guys don't have to deal with this, it was Ben Graham of Manitoba Public Insurance two years ago. He literally got on stage with us in the midst of huge negotiations with the Brokers Association of Manitoba and would not commit to the broker channel. He, I asked him point blank, are you willing to commit to the broker distribution channel that d distributes your product for less than 8% of your overall cost distribution costs and is as efficient as it could? You can't find distribution for less than 8%. It doesn't exist, yet we do it. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't um, commit to that. He didn't see a value for brokers. He was the worst and he was prepared to look all of them in the eyes and give every other answer in the world, but wouldn't commit to brokers. At least the ones that we saw last week and um, it, we see frequently, at least have a positive thing to say about brokers. He couldn't even wow. get that far. Well, that is, uh, did he make it out of the room? Well, he, he did. Um, I actually had a very interesting conversation with him later that night, um, in a bathroom stall. <laughs> uh, and we're not going to ask any more about that. He, he's, he, 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 uh, yeah, we, we'll leave it there, but he is now the, um, he is now the CEO of Manitoba Blue Cross in a surprise oh. move that caught everyone off guard. Yeah. A surprise transition out of the position. So yeah, well, he's well, Australian, so whatever. That, that's what you get for having government run insurance, you know, as well, an Ontario broker that doesn't like it. That's yeah. what you get. Right. So yeah. some people rave about it, but Hey, uh, Peter, you've done, you know, the most prolific podcaster in insurance Canadian history. You're in the hall of fame. Uh, you, what has your, been your favorite topic that you've talked about in all your podcasts? What rises to the top of everybody you've talked to? What topic really lights your fire? Oh, man, You know what? It doesn't matter on the topic as much as the, Pa is the level of passion that the guest has about their their specific field of expertise or whatever. Um, I think what I find is that Canadian guests are typical Canadians, right? We're too polite. We don't brag. We don't stick our chests out enough. And we simply don't think about presenting ourselves and our story in the same way American guests do. The other than one odd episode that Adam was on in terms of um, talking about COVID when we did a quick thing with IBA and Colin and talking about COVID issues, right when everything was hitting back in March, um, the best guests have been the super passionate ones with massive personality who have come from the States. And the one who um, uh, I think about the most recent one from the summer was Bill Peroni from Accord. I mean, okay. you, you probably met him, Jeff, because you've met everyone. Um, Bill's personality is, it's insane, but his enthusiasm for the industry is off the charts and you can't stop him. Like he, he is, he, he's you on meth. <laughs> <laughs> Me on meth. 
<laughs> so for the audience, everyone knows Jeff. That's what you're thinking about here when it comes to comes to intensity. Um, Bill was awesome. I mean, really, it, the best topics are the ones where people are prepared to literally lift the veil up, be open and transparent. It doesn't matter if you're talking UBI, uh, data analytics, um, everything. If you've got a compelling story and you're passionate about it, you make a great guess. It doesn't matter what it is because insurance is a niche area and insurance people should be curious about all the changes going on. I just try to make sure they get a chance to hear about what's going on because not everyone can go to InsureTech Connect. Not everyone can do the conference circuit in the same way. And there's a lot of times where you hear about things that until they're either huge explosions and everyone knows about them, you don't know about all the little things going on. Pete, I couldn't agree with you more when I started speaking in the U.S. and doing all the different keynotes. And I met some incredible people and the passion and, you know, you're yeah. just drawn into you know, the law of attraction. You're just drawn yeah. into what they're doing. And, you know, a lot of people think we're the sleepiest business in the world, but it's the most exciting time in insurance and we're all in it. So it's exciting. Yeah, that's exactly it. Steve, are you, uh, see us? I'm you still here. You're still there? I, yeah. I, Steve always likes to think of really deep, difficult questions. Okay. Go off scripts. So I, I just I wrote. It. I just wrote an article that I don't know where it's going yet. That's going to be talking about Taoism and insurance. So if you want to get deep, I'm right with you. No, I wow. don't think I'll go that deep. Deep thoughts um, by Peter. Peter Handy. Yeah. Let me ask you about tech vendors. Sure. For brokers, because um, yeah. that's kind of what we're all about: discovering new things yeah. and talking to brokers about di digitization. So what's give us a couple nuggets uh that you know chats that you've had or things that you've discovered we might not know about right now um the one i want to work on i think it's yeah. got it's going to be really hard to do but i want to work on it and it'd be easier in more urban places like one million plus uh population cities is lease lock love that concept i don't know if you guys know about lease lock it's a insurance on the damage deposit. It's a very cool thing. And now that we're getting at, now that the rental market is going upside down in places, I don't know if you've seen what's going on in the States um, where New York is plummeting rents and everything. I think lease lock is going to be huge for building managers and stuff. I'd, that's one I'm there. I just spilled my beans. Don't go do it. I want it. Um, the other one that I think uh, is going to, I think brokers and brokers associations, what, you know, one area we forfeit on that I think we need to get control back up is the claims process. I think we've given that Agreed. up and we need to, yeah. we need to reclaim our role in it. And I think the one technology that I've been looking at and I've had the guy on, on the podcast is um, AJ Altman and his company is Hover. Hover is amazing. And if you haven't seen what Hover's doing, I think there is a role on the front end of underwriting risk and the back end with claim solutions to insurance companies with Hover. I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, the other company I'm very interested in, and I actually have a contract with them, all because the CEO and I hit it off so well, is Coalition, uh, Coalition Cyber, with, uh, and the CEO's name is Josh Mata. Um, fantastic guy. And they have found a really easy way to write cyber. But if you're a broker, what's the hardest part about doing cyber insurance? It's trying to make a business owner who's never thought of it understand what cyber is and where the threats are. Their quoting tool is amazing. And you literally can actually quote. Bef so if you have an existing book of business, you can take all your commercial clients and as you come up for renewal, you can literally bring them a cyber quote from coalition and present that to them on renewal. And it's very convincing. And we just, we just got, we've been on it for literally less than 30 days now. And I think we bound like 15 risks. That's good. Um, wow. Yeah. I just, I think the challenge when as Canadians, a lot of people don't understand our market and they've got this idea that Canada is the great white North yet Toronto is the GTA area is what the fourth most populated area in North America. Third, third actually it's number third, three right? Now. Like yeah, it's yeah. huge. Um, 
Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver, Edmonton, all million plus cities. Ottawa is getting close, right? Um, we have density. It's just spread out in a weird way. But it's convincing these companies to come in, go through the regulatory hurdles and say, there's opportunity here. The ones who do it are finding success, but they, they need some guidance. Um, you know, there's a couple AI companies who call me up and say, how do I understand the Canadian market? Like, where do you begin? Right? Like, where do you start telling them to go? It's, it's interesting. You talk about some of the things you're looking at. So, um, you know, from, from all the things you've looked at, from what, you know, what you've seen as a podcast, what you've seen as a broker, you know, cast your mind five years down the road. Uh, what do you think brokers, you know, and we've talked about digitization, you know, obviously the, you know, the digital point podcast is, yeah. you know, stocked with guys who are investing in that, but that that's a relatively small portion of the whole broker channel. So five years down the road, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully be through with COVID, you know, hopefully DX will have pushed some APIs out into the, uh, out into the broker space. Um, what do you think a broker needs to do to survive five years down the road? What's, what's that, what, what does that broker of that 2025 look like? I think the broker 2025 is going to have learned how to segment their customers and they're going to look at uh, geo and demographic era, demographic trends and information to understand what their customers need, how their customers want to experience insurance. So I think consolidation is inevitable again. I think COVID is going to kick more of it in, into gear. I, I think particularly in sparsely populated areas, I think in, in the prairies, you're going to see a wave of opportunity for larger brokers to acquire people who just like, I don't need this headache anymore. It's time to cash out. Um, money's still cheap. Maybe I can still get that, you know, unicorn level multiple that I never thought would be around. So, you know, we're going to get smaller by number of different entities owning brokers, but we're going to learn a lot more and we're going to specialize a lot more. I, I think the other thing that will eventually happen is that brokers, independent brokers of smaller scale in terms of not national chains will find ways to ensure that their value proposition is as strong as a national carrier and that people will return back to the roots of who's in their neighborhood because we're going to adopt technology processes and other aspects to make us as competent as the leading edge national carriers. Like if you're a, a, a BFL or an Aon or, or any of those large entities, AJG and, and you know, the other ones, you should also be very worried right now that technology, your opportunity to get ahead of the rest of us because of technology, that gap is going like this because the technology is getting way more accessible. We don't need enterprise systems anymore. We need incremental options. And when we use those options and we put our traditional value proposition on the line, it beats the snot out of theirs. And companies will adjust to that too. They'll realize their growth isn't with these big guys. It's with the smaller guys who we thought couldn't do it because now they're going to do it. You know, what I've found actually is that's the, you know, the larger organizations have a hard time moving the big battleship. You know, the, the, you know their strategy is, is complicated. You know, implementing new ways of doing things is complicated. Whereas the, you know, the, the small slash medium organization tends to be a hell of a lot more nimble. Um, that's, that's been my experience anyway. I think the one thing we've learned about COVID is that humans crave human interaction. Like we don't, like we want to deal with people, but you want to deal with a face. And if the face offers you a solution that reminds you of how you can go on your banking app and do a few quick things, but you've always got a teller there when you need to have a meaningful conversation in a person, we're the perfect industry to cover both sides. It, it's, and I think as soon as you have to get into large enterprise companies, your market, when our insurance partners catch up a little bit, is going to be large enterprise clients. You, you might get cut out of the market. And that's what I see happening in five years, but it's going to take us a little bit of effort on our national associations, national association to convince insurers that you can do more with us than partnering with these big guys. Pete, we were all hanging out at InsureTech Connect last year uh, yeah. with Wallanisa, had a great time. 
uh, the insure techs came in and they basically, a lot of them thought they were going to completely kill the brokers. You know, our demise, yeah. the, the the prediction of our demise was there. Do you believe it's company vendor, insurance company and broker or insurance company vendor or broker? Uh, there's some people that basically, what's your view on uh, what winning looks like uh, going forward? So I lived through the dot-com industry. I worked for about three of them, I think, before you had dot com on your resume and you couldn't get a job anywhere. And then I, <laughs> right. It was almost like a, it's like, like a black mark on you. Okay. Well you couldn't make it and the industry couldn't make it. A family member of my wife said to me, you know, he goes, y it may suck for you right now in the aftermath of that, but he goes, that experience is going to be invaluable for you later on. Cause you, you lived through something that no one's ever going to want to experience again. After coming out of SureTech connect last year, I, I remember walking around and I went, 60% of these companies won't be here in five years. It's, it's a massive five, investment. Bubble. Five years, maybe, you know, two years. Maybe, maybe two years. A lot of those companies, the ones who survive, will realize that what they thought was happening in the market isn't right. And they'll do a really quick pivot and realize the actual vendor is, the, it, the person I need to partner with is this entity. And there's going to be some that pivot and say the distribution channel is where we're at and some who will say the company channel is where it's at. And then the ones who go with the company channel will say, do I need to be with a company that's distribution, like has a, has a distribution intermediary involved in their product or do I need to be ones that are direct and they're going to streamline it all down. I think we can look at like, you know, look at pro navigator from where they've started to what they're doing now. They had to make a massive pivot. They realized yeah. that this isn't yeah. going the way we thought it would. I think a lot of the AI companies are all switching gears really quick right now. And mm -hmm. they are going to, they're gonna find out that from a consumer standpoint, the broker or agent, whatever you wanna call us, reigns supreme on the trust factor. You wanna yeah. align yourself with where the trust is. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Good to bring up Pro Navigator because you know I was one of the first ones in with Adam Mitchell with the product, and you know I loved the concept, but yeah. the lack of APIs it stalled. Like we couldn't do anymore. I've got voice working, and then it's broken, and there's no resources to get it enabled again. So there's a lot of starts and stops. And the Ask Stage product, they're you know providing that AI and intelligence to brokers. There's a lot better business case there, so they had to pivot as a yeah. startup, which. You know, my chatbot is sitting on the shelf, not getting better at this point, but there will be a, it'll shift into gear at the yeah. next wave as the APIs open up. So, well, they failed, maybe they failed to that or had a partial failure, but they learn from it. Now you get mm -hmm. better. That's what I think so many P brokers are scared about with a digital revolution is they look at it and say, I've got to be like that. Well, those companies didn't get there in six months. They tried. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, the biggest advice I tell other brokers when I chat about them is try one thing and then learn from it, then try another. And it's incremental. You're going to have some bad investments. Maybe there's $50,000 yeah. that you wish you hadn't spent, but yeah. it's way better to lose bet, bet 50 grand on something than it is to bet 500 grand because you never learned beforehand. Yeah. So yeah, no, DX and the DX yeah. project. So connectivity generally, do you a, have have a much faith that you know we'll ever get there yeah. and then b sort of dovetail into that question is is the future of bmss sometimes i feel that bms vendors right now are kind of they're holding us back from taking market share back from directs yeah because we have choice we have trust we have all these things we just our back shop is a fucking mess Oh, yeah. And it really has to do with connectivity. So who's holding us back? Insurance, Great. BMS right. vendors, the, go. The BMS vendor thing, Steve, is such um, a massive uh, issue. It's probably hands down the biggest friction point that's out there. It's not that they're broken, but they don't seem to have a unified idea of how to get to the right place together. <clears throat> the, the, their angle is, is their value proposition is to say, <clears throat> well, we can do all this stuff for you and we can make everything happen, but it's not unified. At the end of the day, if there is a standard that works, we should be able to customize whatever we want on our ends to read that information. 
there's a company that another um, Salesforce based one called Velocity that looks really interesting to me. Hey, just um, before you know, the, the next great uh, broker one, Be Atomic uh, Neon, just went on the App Exchange. I want to let you bleeding edge guys who have some few more infrastructure things um, ahead of me, Steve or um, Jeff, go down that road to learn a little bit. And then I'm, I'm, I want to follow suit. I'm, I'm a big believer in what I've seen so far. But the, see, the BMS thing is they care about beating each other as much as they care about helping the broker. And they don't, that doesn't align. You know, I'm an applied broker, not by, not by choice, but there's 3,000 data points that are coming in in our, in our downloads that I can't access. What the hell are we paying for? Or you have data points that are being erased. That's the other thing. Um, you don't want to really throw darts at people. And, and look, I, you know, I, I'm good friends with the guy, with the Andrew brothers and everything. And, and, and full disclosure here, I actually, like Scott Andrew, the Andrew agencies bought my brokerage. Like, the, you know, let's just be honest. I, I, anyone who has a conversation with me about BMS, I always disclose that because I don't want anyone to think I'm, I'm beholden to them or whatever. That was a different business deal, but they've all got a solution. I think some are better than others, but they don't align with each other. My, one of my favorite quotes in the insurance industry came from Alistair Campbell. And he said, insurance isn't just copyable, it's photocopyable. Well, a, a BMS should almost be the same way. It isn't just a copyable feature. It's a photocopyable feature. Then figure out what your other value proposition is. You all need to work the same way. And I know one insurance company exec told me, he goes, the days of us working with these guys and then, you know, to do something for them, and giving them $30 million over five years to do whatever it is, those are done. We don't need that anymore because they see there's other solutions. If enough insurance companies take that stance of saying, we don't need to pay the BMS vendors to do the work for us, then I think we're going to have some movement. So Pete, you, you haven't really answered my questions. Connectivity. Yes. Is it a pipe dream? No. Is it, I, I think there's going to be slivers know, of it and some will lag behind. And I think what's going to happen, Steve, is there will be some companies that buy in, do it, get it done. And as a broker, we will make decisions of whether we want to partner with those and work with them and cast off the market, the other markets. I don't think all will buy in. So your answer is a little bit. Then let's bring the BMSs into that and say, Connectivity, are they helping or hindering? Yeah, I, I think some are going to work and, 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 and make DX happen and others will lag behind because they know they can keep making money and will eventually spin it off in a different way. But now there's, there's a, you know, a large and growing number of, call them insure tax or broker tax or whatever you want to call them, which insurance tax will be the most useful to brokers in the next one to three years? Any that parses my data files on my existing customer transactions and can tell me what my customers are doing to me, doing with me. Or, Frequency of contact, um, claim severity, type of claim, um, anything that can come in there and tell me exactly what's going on with my customers and how I can get rid of the, find the trends of the ones I don't want. Here, let me say this. Any technology that allows me to be as disciplined and cold-hearted as an insurance company is about their risks. They're prepared to walk away from bad risks. Why don't we? Today, every risk pays you the same amount of money. You, or you, you, you perceive it to pay you the same amount yeah. of money. Right now, you don't have the intelligence or knowledge, business intelligence or knowledge, to be able to differentiate between those risks. But there is a difference between those risks. Yeah. So you're, you're looking for something that will guide yeah. you in terms of being able to differentiate. Yeah. Do you guys recall when Applied took the, um, took the whatever rating tool they had, the RCT, and then they decided they weren't going to continue on it and they moved to Easy ITV and you had customers that you'd rated in. Let's just talk personal lines here. Um, and all of a sudden you couldn't access that data. You couldn't store it. Kurt Wyatt called me up and he goes, can you believe this shit? And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I can't access the data I entered into this. They won't let me have it. He went postal on applied about that. Yeah. And um, he got it back, but they didn't offer it to everyone. Like we've handed over data for years, right? We just yeah. 
giving it to everyone. Oh, you do the work for us. We're just so happy to have a sale and have the customer and, you know, blah, blah, blah. No one ever We're, told us what we could do with it. We go down to the mine, we do all the typing and we get all the data. We bring it up to the surface and the vendors take that data and say, thanks very much. Yeah. And they go ahead and aggregate and they sell it back to our companies and other people yeah, and they make exactly. money of it. We have a data problem right now. And that's why we don't have intelligent data because we just fill out forms. We don't have the behavior around the data because each of us, because our systems allow us to, to modify and pimp it out the way we want it, yeah. which in the past was cool, but that's hurting us because Steve makes data different. Your office makes data differently. And we can't aggregate that data and get the collective insights to make business decisions. The current yeah. BMSs can't do that. They weren't designed to do that. No. So do you feel that there's going to be a new evolution and be atomic has already figured this out and building a data lake to figure this out? What do you think about that? I, I think it's, that's the way to go. I was just uh, approached to um, by a company called Refocus AI who's looking to work with brokers in Canada and he was asking me, trying to understand the, um, the, the world up here. And I, and so I kind of looked up what the product was and it's basically taking CSV sheets from your BMS, uploading it into them and they apply intelligence to it. And so you can do queries on it. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. But again, <laughs> yeah. I'm uploading to you. Yeah. yeah exactly. Right. Right. These are the yep. keystrokes that we pay our people good money to put in. Yep. They sell those keystrokes and they charge us for the pleasure of doing so. Yep. Well, they also yes. charge us extra I money agree. to get to buy an analytics or a different product yeah. to get access to our data because it's not put in there very well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we have to pay extra That's money. Right. We put they sell our data, but and then we get a, a five, eight percent increase so, every year. So, so this is where I think insurance vendors should be scared of is when brokers or intermediaries find a way to interact outside the BMS via social media and what tools become available via social media that we can glean from our customers that way, right? Like that's where I'm a little uh, very interested in. And I think the bleeding edge in the future is we've got all these other data points that are external. I need to identify like in my, in my dream world, I would know not just my customer's email address. I would know their Facebook account, their Instagram account, their Twitter account, their TikTok, their Snapchat and everything. And I would use hire the companies that deal with that stuff to figure out what they're doing. Just kind of so, shift gears here. Do you think, uh, I just want to throw this out, like the standards, I think CISO is doing a good job of coming up with standards. And uh, Steve sits in the CISO board uh, and is doing a phenomenal job. The one struggle we have is when people change them, how do they communicate and implement that change? When it's a regulated change like auto insurance, they mm -hmm. change it, everybody does it immediately. But when it's not regulated, uh, my opinion is we need to do a better job of making sure people are in the most current version and pushing that out. And DX is reliant partially on making sure that, hey, we have the standards, we're all using them and we keep up to speed with them. If people are in different versions of the standards, it's very difficult to do that. Do you feel that as an industry, we can get that better? And is that an area we should be improving? Or what's yes. your thoughts on the, the CZO and implementation? You know what really surprised me about CZO is that, yes, you have various brokers and you have entities from uh, different like IBAC and stuff. Why doesn't every broker's association have a staff member on that board or in, in some sort of way of constant communication? Because that's the outflow, particularly if you're in a place on the prairies, maybe out in Atlantic Canada, not no disrespect for anyone out here, but we're not the biggest hubs, right? We're not the, the massive population. And so we need more alertness of what's going on. We need our associations to be involved and in giving us updated things about how this affects um, your day-to-day -day operations. Not to hear, because not every broker is a CZO member. Not yeah, everyone, yeah. They, they don't even, some don't even know they can be. Yeah. Like every, every association needs a Tom. Like Tom, clone yeah. yourself and have, you know, or you should be going to every association saying, who are you going to nominate who comes and works with you? 
let's make your job at IBAC permanent, right? We, we'll get you the retirement plan here. We'll be a lifer. <laughs> well, and, and who I'm works not, with you and like how do you get this information out? Vendors and companies, if they hear any competing messages, oh, I have competing messages, I'm going to do nothing. That's been the problem. So there's no place to hide right now. Yeah. Tom is holding everybody accountable. We're speaking with one voice and Tom is hitting the ground running and that communication message. Like we do a really bad job of communicating change in our industry. And that's one of the things that we're working through collectively to fix. I want to make one correction there. I'm actually not reaching out to all the associations. I have been working with IBO because they have resources and experience that can help. We do have <clears throat> on IBAC, we do have the IBAC tech committee with both those guys are members of they're there because they they are the representatives of their local associations yeah. in fact uh we're, you know we're, we will be doing some of that once we get a, a little bit further down the road with yeah. the X. But, but i but, i've been there tom though like i've been on the iBAC technology and i chaired it when i was a director and it's an inefficient way of information distribution when you're talking about technology you can't meet three times a year because every meeting, no way. the world has changed since the yeah. last meeting. I think when I joined originally, there were, there were five people. We have more brokers there now. The entire country is represented. That's great. And we lobbied uh, IBAC for resources. The first resource was a full-time person, be yeah. it Kim Oppheim, because somebody needs to be doing this work between the meetings. Yeah. The committee can't do it. We all have day yeah. jobs and brokerages. Yeah. That is a full time fucking job every day. Live it, learn it, love it, push. Yeah, absolutely. Insurers, what are you doing? Vendors, what are you doing? CSIO, what yeah. are you doing? Insurers, vendors, and they were dividing us and saying, well, you know what? We're not hearing that from them. Oh, IBAO has this thing going on. We own so many resources. You know, what, what do we put it to? And is nothing was moving. So you need, we needed a person to, to push the agenda forward, but create cohesion and share because there were multiple projects going on and there still are that are running parallel to each other. It's like, Hey, you guys, you're working on that. So are they. We've re-engineered the tech committee over the last couple of years. We're a lot more nimble. We're changing the cadence of how often we meet. We've got people like Tom and Kim as resources in there. Like, let's be honest, the, all the political people, it was all about the bipper and, you know, keeping government out of insurance, which they did a phenomenal job, but they put no money and focus on the technology. Now that shift's happened. They've all awakened going, you know what? Our future is connectivity and they're putting money and they're supporting yeah. us. And Peter Bray and Nicole and Simpsons get it hundred yeah. percent. And they're all putting the money and we're all coming together as, as one to fix this because this is a problem we can't fix yeah. alone. We have to unite and do it, right? Exactly. Jeff, I think you hit on something that a few people want to talk about, but I, I will. IBAC put a lot of effort and money into keep the banks out, worry about the Bank Act, political activism, solve your problems by making sure the politicians know. So they took off and they went like this and then they got up to cruising speed. This is where you're not burning any as much energy as this. And at, once they got up here, they just thought, oh, we're all in the first class lounge. We're having cocktails. No one cared about it, anything else. And we needed to get the technology into this phase. I'm glad it's there now because that's what was missing in it all. Like there's enough resources. We've got what, 45,000 brokers in Canada or something like that now to, to, to take on multiple projects and get them moving at the same time in concurrent fashion, aiming for the same target. And yeah. it can all aim to the political end. It can all aim to the consumer end. And, it, it, you know, it, it, there's no reason to just focus on the bipper. We've never been in a better spot to make things done. And there's yeah. no place to hide because pe the four of us here can see people that are hiding and stalling. And, uh, you know, you used to be able to hide for three years yeah. and nobody saw anything coming. But now there's no place to hide. And the companies like Walmanisa Lanisa, that are blazing a trail trying to connect, putting the money into it, trying to help brokers doubling down, you know, being the poster child, that is incredible because yeah. we need some people like that. And, you know, Tom, Tom's doing getting some really good momentum. So uh, yeah. we're excited about what's happening. There's a lot of work to be done, but we're, we're going in the right direction. Well, there's a whole bunch of brokers and there's a whole bunch of people working oh, on yeah. stuff um, to keep us relevant, but the average broker doesn't know what's going on. No, no. and that's why I say there needs to be mini Toms. 
And we need some other people and associations, even ones like IBAM that maybe don't have the, the cloud of the IBAOs, the, the diversity of IBABC or, or, or IBAB or IBA, insurance brokers, uh, IBAA, whatever they are. Um, you know, like we need everyone in there to join, but because there, there's threats on all fronts and companies, vendors, tech, entities they find weak spots and they go after it and you know they're always there there has been times when there has been ceos who aren't favorable to what they say they are in terms of their distribution channel but then they turn around and do the opposite and you know everyone needs to be aware of where the where this can go like we don't do a very good job in manitoba of giving a, a tech update and getting people involved to say this is what you need to think about strategically for the functionality and long-term survival of your brokerage. In my opinion, um, connectivity or lack thereof scares me way more than the Bank Act. And here's the recipe for disaster is the Bank Act changes. Yep. And we don't have that connectivity solved. That. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's really disastrous. But what should scare the bejesus out of everyone is the open banking movement and what yeah. that technology is going to do. Because again, we're all kind of catching up to how the banks interact with their customers on non-necessity uh, transactions, right? The self-serve ones, the things that you can do by yourself. We know it works. If it didn't work, they wouldn't invest, invest in it and they wouldn't be making a billion dollars a quarter by making it efficient and still raising our bank fees, right? There, there's a model that works, but when open banking comes, what happens down the pipeline of what can be piggybacked on that model? That's what keeps me up at night. And if we don't have connectivity, we're done. Because open banking is about data and the banks are freaking out about this because it basically means anyone can start taking data and integrating financial transactions in a far more efficient way I, I, I'm not an expert on it. I understand it from a point of view that I know I need to learn more about it and be a little more nervous about it. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. It's awesome. Hey, good. You know, this is a great conversation, Peter. Yeah. Well, well just one thing, uh, Peter, we, one question I have for you. If you had a magic wand, what is the one problem or thing you would fix right now in the industry? Oh, uh, the one thing I want to know is how my customers behave. Like I want to know what my customers are doing because if I control that information, I can then challenge what the insurance companies are telling me about what my customers need. Legally, how do we take back control and ownership of our data? So we're talking about wow. those key clicks. How do we own them? The client has the most legit claim to the data. It's, it's them, yeah. right? It's, it's my age, it's my birth, it's my address, whatever but I'm giving you the right to use it. So you've got the second best claim to it. So I guess I just, I just want to throw that customer thing yeah. in there. But if you take them out, then the broker certainly has the most legitimate claim to the data. So if we are data mining and data harvesting out of things, we have, we have the different implied and expressed data consent issues. But what if the sole purpose of what you're doing when you enter data in is to use it? Do we need to have user agreements with our clients? Like if we go into a strictly online world of the simple transactional actions of insurance that may require semi-frequency, do they need to agree to terms when they're using a digital service? I don't know. Absolutely. Like I think, I mean, we should all know this because we live in the world of risk, right? Like we should be thinking about it, but from a, from a practice point, maybe that's the case. I, I don't know. It's a good question. Again, these are things though that associations get bogged down on lots of things, but this is the stuff they should be providing us. Is, Pete, that, 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 that might actually, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. That might actually, might actually be a way to address Steve's question because if there is a explicit contract between the customer and the broker saying, you know, basically the client saying, I own my data. I'm giving you the rights to my data. So now, you know, legally that broker now has that right to that data. So that, that, that could be a way, Steve, for you, to, yeah. for you to address that is to say, well, listen, client owns the data, feds have said so, that's the law of the land. 
that client has transferred the right to that data to me and I'm not transferring it to you. Intact, Applied, yeah. Teal, whoever. I'm not transferring it to you. We've Unless, all signed contracts already Yeah, to say that we're doing that. And if we don't, we don't have a BMS. We don't have a contract with that insurer. Yeah. But like if the gun, the well, gun was put why, to our head. Why do yeah. we need a knowingly BMS? or unknowingly? Why yeah. do we need a BMS? Great question. To do all this stuff for us when it's simply right now, right now, EDI. Why can't we build our own modules that do the EDI? Because it's, it's not just EDI. It's not just it's not just right. EDI though. Ra it's, rate rating right now is it's huge. The rating. Rating is huge. So rating take the really rating huge. out of the out of the um, BMS. Then there's no more BMSs. Really. Then there's no more BMSs. Yeah. No, no well, I said, like I said, like I, I like to be open. Like, I, if, like applied is going to more of an open source, which is great, very positive. And I use a rating product, and it's by far the best in the market. So yeah. there's certain things that they do very well. But I want to be able to build my own experience, but, like Salesforce. You can plug and play stuff into that, right? So we are let, limited what we can do, right? Let me let me throw this at you. When I talk to my team and I say, you're going to quote this person, whether it's a condo, a tenant, a small contractor, small business, or a $50 million TIV manufacturer, do you, after you talk to the person, whoever it is, do you know what company you want to put them with? And if they say no, I say you haven't done your job. Because if you should know, your qualifying question should guide you down to that point where you say, I only need to think about company A, company B, or company C. And that's who you want the APIs with. Pete, uh, thank you very much for appearing on the show. Cheers, boys. You're welcome. Cheers. And I'd like to give a uh, <clears throat> shout out to our uh, sponsors. So we've got crew.io. And, uh, and Gore Mutual, who have been so kind as to help support us so that we can support WIC uh, with the billions of dollars they're giving us. And uh, also quick shout out to Garrison, who is our beer sponsor of nice. today's episode. So yeah. Pete, I'm gonna give you the last word. Uh, kind of cut you off on your, uh, it's on okay. your chat there, but I'll give you hey, the last word. You got uh, 60 seconds. Let's Go. just do this again, um, six months. Happy to come back and chat about some things and keep going. Cheers. We'll whittle it down and cheers, guys. Thanks. It's great yeah. that more people are talking openly about these these things. The more dialogue, the better brokers are going to be. So, hey, you know, hey, I, thanks for opening thanks. the top and raising. It's all the about bar. the yeah. brokers. So open the top. <laughs> cheers. Open the top. Raise the bar with conversation. And I'm going to get better swag for the cheers. podcast. <laughs> thanks, guys. All right. Yeah. See you guys. All right. <clears throat>